right. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. So um, this afternoon, uh, we'll hear some reactions to this morning's talks from three of our colleagues. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce all three of them at the beginning, and we'll hear their responses to the talks from this morning, and then we'll open up to questions and more discussion. Um, we did briefly um, get kicked off of Zoom after the morning session. So um, while I think our chat got saved, um, we did lose access to it so um, until the end. So if you wanna go ahead and put um, any questions that didn't get answered in the chat again, that would be helpful to Nick um, as he's the question moderator. Um, so each speaker will have about 15 minutes and then we'll have 45 minutes for an open and wide ranging discussion about the talks from this morning. Um, so with no further ado, uh, let me introduce our panelists. First up, we have Dot Porter as Curator of Digital Research Services in the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies at Penn Libraries. Dot Porter participates in a wide ranging digital humanities research and development team within the context of a special collections department. DOT's projects focus on the digitization and visualization of medieval manuscripts. DOT holds master's degrees in medieval studies and library science and started her career working on image-based digital editions of medieval manuscripts. She has worked on a variety of digital humanities projects over a decade long career focusing on materials as diverse as ancient texts and Russian religious folklore, providing both technical support and scholarly expertise. Um, also speaking is Bridget Weirty. Dr. Bridget Weirty earned her BA from the University of Montana in 2003 and her PhD from Stanford University in 2013. From 2013 to 2015, she was a Council on Libraries and Information Resources CLEAR po Postdoctoral Fellow in Data Curation for Medieval Studies wor working within Stanford University Libraries. Since 2015, she has served as an assistant professor at Binghamton University in New York State, where she teaches courses on medieval English literature, the history of the book, and the global Middle Ages. Bridget has published on medieval death culture and Chaucer reception, on descriptive metadata and data curation through the lens of medieval poetry, and on digital manuscripts and the summoner and the Canterbury Tales. Bridget is currently finishing her first monograph, currently entitled Digital Codicology, Medieval Books and Modern Laborers. And speaking third will be Eric Quackle. Dr. Eric Quackle is professor at and director of the University of British Columbia School of Information, where he teaches and researches the history of the book. His, re his research interests include book design and communication in the pre-modern world, particularly how information was disseminated and consumed before the invention of the printing press. His research and teaching covers a broad range of disciplines, including digital humanities, digitization of cultural heritage, visual arts, history, and cultural studies. He has published 10 monographs and edited volumes. And his current research focuses on the broader cultural processes behind knowledge consumption in societies that depend on written communication. Um, so um, we'll start with Dot. Hi, I'm trying to get my, there we go. I'm reading from my screen. Um, but I, but it's strange to read from my screen and not see people. So I have to like organize my, my screen so I can see you and I can also see my, um, my text. Thank you, Jesse, um, for, uh, corralling us today. And, uh, thanks to everyone who's here. Thanks also to Alicia and Kim and Johanna and to Bill for their presentations this morning. They all reflected today's theme in really interesting ways. Uh, today's theme being interrogating interfaces and digital representation, images, metadata, uh, and screens, a thing that is very uh, special to me too. So I'm, I'm pleased to be responding today. The Florentine Codex Initiative presented by Alicia and Kim is an attempt to create in a digital space, a version of a physical manuscript, actually a set of manuscripts that it is self as fascinating as it is complex. Translating a physical object, its text and illustrative contact, content and the physical aspects of it as well into a digital space is difficult even when the texts and objects are simple. But when you add in 
this multiple languages that you have to translate and also the complicated history that's a part of the physical object and then part of the text and the illustrations inside it. Um, it um, becomes much more difficult in a technical sense, a real challenge for digital representation, um, which I should say, I, I think they're, they're everything that they've said, they're doing it right. And I'd love to talk more about that project in the Q and A. In her talk, Johanna Green came from a sort of different point of view. She talked about her own personal experiences with physical manuscripts and digital ones. And she provided a lot of food for thought around what digital manuscripts are even, positing that digital manuscripts, rather than simply being facsimiles or reflections of physical objects, uh, should be appreciated as objects in their own right. And finally, Bill Endress, who has been pushing boundaries for as long as I've known him and probably much longer than that. Uh, he talked about ways to translate the wonder of what it's like to view manuscripts in person in, uh, in a digital space. And I think this is a really important thing to sort of add to the pot that we're talking about. How to give us an experience with a digitized manuscript, which is not so much like interacting with the real thing, which we, I think we think about a lot. How, we, how can we bring the thing into the digital space? But giving us a sense instead of the emotion of a physical uh, interaction. Uh, and in this way, I think his paper sort of melds in interesting ways with, with what Johanna had to say about interacting with, with the material and the digital. I'm actually going to begin my own comments where I'm gonna go off, of course, in an entirely different direction uh, with a story. I love stories and I love thinking about manuscripts as stories and projects as stories. So of course I'm gonna tell a story. Uh, it's not my story, but I'm sure a lot of you know it. Um, and I'm not the first person to relate this specific story to the issue of manuscript digitization. And I won't be the last, but it's been on my mind uh, ever since the first paper started on uh, three days ago. And as I've been watching the presentations and listening to the great conversation coming out of them, it keeps coming back to me. So I figure I'm gonna put it forward so you all can think about it too. So I begin. In that empire, the art of cartography obtained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the cartographer's guilds struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the vast map was useless and not without some pitilessness was it, that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of that map inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. Suarez Miranda, Viajes de Verones Prudentes, book four, chapter 45, Lerida, 1658. This is of course not a quote from Suarez Miranda's magnum opus, but it is the short story, which we call on, in English, on exactitude in science by Jorge Louis Borges from his collected fictions translated by Andrew Hurley. I am very often in the weeds of digitization and digital humanities projects. I do a lot of coding, um, but occasionally I like to take a step back and theorize a little bit. It's easy sometimes, or at least I find it easy, maybe you don't find it easy, to focus a lot on the technical things, on things like timelines and codes, on what software is available and what we can do with what we have, um, and also to sort of focus on the, the limits of my own knowledge and sort of work with what I know. Um, to then to set aside the more abstract issues around uh, development. So on exactitude in science is something that I return to again and again when I think about it, because it describes one of my great fears. Am I, are we, simply working to create representations that are trying to become the thing itself, only to end up failing miserably? There was actually a time when I thought this was the case. I really worried about this. I distinctly remember a paper I presented in 2008, where I had harsh words for the British libraries turning the pages. I think I used the term manuscript zombie or something like that to describe the way that the interface mimicked the way a manuscript moves without quite getting it right. So you could sort of see it if you knew how a manuscript moves, you'd say, oh, that's, that's not quite right. 
Um, and I've had similar responses, sort of gut responses, emotional responses to other visualization technologies, including 3D and VR. But I think that coming out of these three days, I'm happy to report that I'm no longer feeling so negative. Um, and I have to admit this is a long process, but these three days have sort of really helped me here. Um, it helps, I will admit, to hear Johanna talk about her earliest experience with the manuscript being mediated through turning the pages, that she didn't care, quote, I'm quoting her, she didn't care that any of those things were artificial. She just kind of thought being able to turn and hear the pages was cool. And the cool factor is something also that I have uh, in the past turned up my nose at a, a little bit. But more recently, I've come around to it, not just as a as a sort of thing to do over here, but as a legitimate piece of the puzzle that we're all working on, or you might say the map that we're all building uh, to sort of continue that, um, that reference. I look at the work that Laura Moriale and her colleagues are doing with the editing sprints, the outreach to students that Johanna and Kim and Alicia and many others have talked about this week, and to the work that many of us are doing with social media in an attempt to bring our projects and collections to new audiences, an attempt to get people interested in what we're doing, to express to other people how cool and interesting our work is. Um, when I originally wrote this, I said here, how to make it cool. And somebody I showed it to uh, pointed out that it is cool. Don't say make it cool, say show people how cool it is. We just have to sh show other people because we know it is, because we're here, we're doing this work, it's interesting. But how do you get that across to other people who don't already feel that way. Um, and I've done a bit of this myself, um, thinking particularly at a project that I did a uh, year before last, back in 2008, uh, with Dr. Brandon Hawk at Rhode Island College. Um, we examined the manuscripts that were presented in Star Wars, The Last Jedi. If you've seen The Last Jedi, there are, there's a tree and there are these manuscripts and they're really cool. Um, so we compared those manuscripts with manuscripts uh, from Penn's collections to get a sort of an idea of where the artists who designed these for the movies, because obviously Star Wars universe doesn't exist, artists exist and they made these things. Um, where, they, where they may have found inspiration. And it was a really interesting project. And um, maybe when I'm done talking, I'll put a link in uh, the chat if you're interested in seeing that. It was a fun project. Um, and much of what I've seen presented and discussed this week is among other things, uh, fun. And perhaps one thing that we can take with us out of this COVID-19 experience where we're sort of stuck at home um, is this acknowledgement that it's worthwhile to make our work fun and interesting for ourselves and for our audiences, uh, and that we can do it without watering down the scholarly aspects of what we do, which is a, I think is a thing that we worry about a little bit, um, but you don't have to, you can make it fun and interesting without taking it down. I'm gonna go back to Borsch for a minute. Sorry, I'm sort of all over the place, but I hope this makes some sense. Um, Borsch's story describes a map a flat representation of a three-dimensional object. And one must wonder, or at least I wonder, if its flatness was part of the reason it was unable to succeed as a representation. Um, if it were instead a three-dimensional map that coincided exactly to every part of it would have been, have been successful. And taking this idea and applying it to the work that we do, if you could make a digital representation that is not flat, but is instead fully three-dimensional, exact, exactly like the digital object, would that be successful? I don't, I don't think that's what we want. And in any case, I don't actually think that that's what we're, what we're doing. Um, I think what we're in the process of building, this is our collective magnum opus, the digitization and description of manuscripts around the world. Uh, it, it's not flat and it's not as a single object and we've talked, we've seen so many people talk about various aspects of this. So I'm just gonna sort of lay it out. It is rather millions of objects, maybe billions, I don't know. It's a very large number, objects of many different types and they're all placed in pots that keep them separated but they're also tangled together. They're tangled together in technical ways. Triple IF is a kind of tangling that if you have pots that are triple IF compliant, they're kind of tangled together in a way but it's also, um, more intangible than that. So if I have a book on my shelf, 
that uh, has a description of a manuscript, it has a, ta it's a tangle, it's connected to the manuscript that's sitting on a shelf hundreds of miles away, even though there's nothing except my brain put it making that connection. So there's a lot of these sorts of connections. And even if we're talking about a single manuscript, we have potentially many, many different types of these, just things that have been mentioned this week. We have catalog records. We have the aforementioned book that cites the manuscript to make scholarly arguments. We have physical descriptions, perhaps physical descriptions that have been made over time. We might have several different ones. Um, and even if the manuscript itself hasn't changed, those physical descriptions will contain different information because of what was of interest to the people who were making the description at the time. And it's, it is interesting if you look, if you take sort of a historical look at, at catalog, at physical descriptions in catalogs, they really change a lot from the 19th century and even earlier to now. Um, and then there are videos, uh, photographs, again, digital photographs taken over time Bill Endress has done work with this layering photos and seeing how manuscripts have changed and also how the te fat foot photographic technology has changed. You see both of them when you do that. Um, microfilm is another type of photograph. Uh, and now we've, we've been talking earlier this morning about photos taken with cell phones and put on social media. And there's a whole other issue contained with those, but they're there for us for the taking. So it's less like a giant map a 3D map or a flat map, and more like these buckets of, I'm thinking of them like miniatures that are sort of dumped on the real thing. Sometimes these miniatures reflect the physical object, but more often than not, they fall short of exactness. But that's okay, because most of these things are designed to illustrate something really specific about the real thing, rather than the, the thing in its, in its entirety. And so what you want to do is like take all these little pieces and pull them together. Um, so the question then, as we've already discussed and we'll hopefully discuss again here and in the future, is how best to gather together these pieces and present them in a way that they're most useful to users. Um, users who come from different audiences, who are researching different things, um, or perhaps users who are just there to have fun and play with them. I like to do that. Um, also, we have to think about these audience people who have different abilities who perhaps have disabilities, who can't see or can't hear or can't feel, how, how will that change the kinds of things that we're doing and have different access to technology? If someone doesn't have access to the web, how can we serve them? Can we? Do we just say, well, we, we don't care about you? So we aren't looking at combining the miniatures into a single new and improved map. Uh, perhaps we're looking at ways to make it possible for users to combine them themselves in many and very different ways, uh, depending on these needs and limitations and what's available. Um, and that brings up a whole other set of issues like citation. If somehow there's this magic system where we can sort of, I can sort of bring things together as I want them. And then I just say it's ephemeral and it goes away. How do I tell you about that later? How do I cite it? Citation obviously is something we all um, think about a lot. But I'm going to stop now abruptly, like our lives did back in March. And thank you for your attention. And I'm excited uh, for the conversation. And I'm also excited to hear what um, Bridget and Eric have to say. Um, so now I'm going to step back to give Bridget Querty an opportunity to speak. But first, I need to congratulate her. Um, which she just received news today, or I received news today, I think she knew already, that she received the Early Career Essay Prize from the New Chaucer Society. So put your hands together for her, because that's a great honor. Uh, for her. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Bridget. Thank you, Dot. Um, I thank you for the uh, congratulations and thank you for your really provocative and um, exciting uh, offerings. And I'm seeing some really neat ways that, that some of what you're saying and some of what I'm saying will, will fit together. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, I want to start um, with uh, praise and gratitude to our organizers. Um, organizing a symposium has always seemed to me to be a lot like ballet. The easier it looks, the more effortless it seems, the harder the work must have been behind the scenes. Um, you have all made this look easy and incredibly graceful. Um, like this is just the natural way of holding a world-class symposium online during a worsening pandemic. Uh, 
and this grace only suggests how hard you all must have been working for an incredibly long time. Um, I also want to open with my praise and gratitude for our morning speakers. Um, the papers were incredibly uh, inspiring. Um, as someone who teaches global introduction to medieval and early modern studies courses, as well as book history and manuscript studies courses, I am so eager for the Florentine Codex initiative. I cannot wait to use this and teach this. This is incredible. Um, and my heart really lifted when you showed that photo of Kim's desk and pointed out that that cluttered concordance pile is itself a privilege. Um, this is access that some of us actually don't have without the magic of interlibrary loan. And all of us lost abruptly in the spring. Um, I love how your project emphasizes that manuscript studies doesn't just depend on some kind of access to primary objects of study, that it requires these larger networks of scholarship and transcription and translation. I really admire how your project is cracking open and sharing those multiple layers of access and accessibility. Um, and uh, Bill, Bill Enders, I love your work. Um, and I particularly liked how your presentation this morning invites us to reflect more deeply on the relationship between manuscripts and human bodies, um, both in terms of sort of our bodies in reading rooms, turning pages and engaging with the physical book, but also to consider how manuscripts might change readers' bodies by quite literally rewriting and changing their or our brains. Um, that, that was really thrilling. Um, Joanna Green's description of how her chemotherapy induced neuropathy, which changed what she could and could not do and feel in hands-on study of manuscripts, seems to me an important companion piece to Christopher Baswell's 2006 critique of the inaccessibility of certain manuscript collections, which he pointedly entitled, It is only in the Bodleian that I am a cripple. As a field, we live for the specificity of our particular manuscripts. But we also tend toward generalization and abstraction in other areas. The archive, the book, the researcher, the body. By sharing her particular experiences with chemotherapy and cancer, Green reminds us what we do is always embodied, whether we are working hands-on with codices or hands-on with keyboards and screens. What we do has always been embodied. And she reminds us that our individual bodily experiences are significant and significantly different from each other. She challenges us to consider how to take seriously those differences, which I think is incredibly important to consider in the face of our pandemic. Building on these threads from our morning presentations, um, I want to kind of use them as a springboard to engage with a question the conference organizers asked us to consider, um, which is, has access to these artifacts of our shared intellectual heritage become more open and equitable? Or are there still hurdles, hurdles for scholarship around the world to overcome? I'm gonna go with yes, and also yes. Uh, I want to talk um, about how access has become more equitable. And I wanna highlight a few significant hurdles we need to overcome, as well as some things that I think we can begin to do now. To, to address those, to, to leap those hurdles. Um, in what follows, what I'm about to say will make more sense if you understand where I'm coming from. So I did my undergraduate work at a public university in the rural Western United States that owned, and 20 years later today, still owns no medieval manuscripts. I did my PhD and my postdoc at a well-funded private institution with a sizable collection of medieval manuscripts and several robust digital humanities programs. I teach in one of the flagship public research universities in New York State. But we are a young university. And even before the pandemic and the recession, we were not what you would call rich. In manuscript studies, there is a commonplace, a shared credo, that real rigorous scholarly work takes place with hands-on study of physical books. Like Joanna, I want to push back on this. I want us to question what we are losing, and I want us to question who we are losing with this commonplace that Joanna this morning rightfully named elitist. Even before the pandemic hit, 
our shared credo put my students, undergraduate and graduate, in a tough place. When I arrived at my institution in 2015, we owned one medieval codex and some fragments. We want to give our students the best kind of opportunities that we can. And so we have worked for years, fundraising, courting donors, seeking outside fellowships and grants to build up a collection of physical manuscripts so we can give our students what our field says they need. We've worked at this for five years and we now have five codices and some fragments. Last spring, I was finally able to teach a graduate course designed to give our students the kind of hands-on experience and training that is the gold standard of our field. You all know where this story is going. In the blink of an eye, in March, all of that ended. On the one hand, it was horrible to have finally built a physical collection for hands-on teaching that now we could not use, to go back to relying on digital manuscripts that we had been told were not enough but which we had still been relying on all along. On the other hand, it was great because now the leading manuscript studies and scholars in the world were stuck in the same place as us. This is digital democratization, not perhaps the kind we have always hoped for with all of us sharing the same possibilities and opportunities, but at least all of us sharing the same limits. But that's not actually true, is it? As the authors of the recently released study, Digital Inequality During a Pandemic note, calamities are often a story of inequality. COVID is no different. In the United States, jobs lost, lives lost, can be plotted directly along systemic racial and economic disparities. Pandemic pedagogy has painfully shown how this global public health crisis is exacerbating the kinds of digital divides, inequalities, and disparities that already existed. These inequalities and disparities haunt my institution and institutions like mine, of which there are many. We have no in-house digitization program. There was no way for us to get digital access to those physical manuscripts. Eight miles away, they might have been on the moon. We cannot afford VR technology. There's no institutional funding for the kind of over-the-shoulder technology that Dot Porter and Joanna Green are using so successfully. The truth is that a high number of my students are still struggling more than six months into this crisis to achieve adequate regular internet access. My university tries. Uh, it expanded its existing laptop and Wi-Fi hotspot loaner program, extended on-campus Wi-Fi coverage to various parking lots, although this really only helps students, staff, and faculty with cars. Um, and when the seasonal temperatures drop below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, that's minus seven Celsius, that's a really uncomfortable learning environment. Bill Enders reminds us that our human bodies become the measure when we encounter manuscripts. Sitting in a cold car in a parking lot, working on a phone or tablet or laptop is difficult. It's a profoundly embodied way to encounter digitized manuscripts and digital manuscript projects. Research in digital inequality teaches us that internet access is not evenly distributed, nor is adequately strong and up-to-date hardware. And it never has been. Some of the first publications on digital scriptorium put out before the turn of the millennium stress the difficulties that graduate students experienced in 1998, saddled with weak internet connections at home that could not access what, at the time, were shockingly high quality and enormous images. One of the things that I hope COVID does for manuscript studies is blow up, or at least make much more nuanced, any claims about digital democratization. To riff off the maxim that is often attributed to William Gibson, the future may already be here, but it is not and never has been evenly distributed. So now that COVID has made us face this truth about our field, what can we do about it? In our conversations over the past few days, we've been discussing the importance of deliberately light metadata as a best practice for interoperability. We might think also of deliberately light project iterations as a kind of similar good practice. As we build out beautiful, complex, rigorous, exciting work that makes my heart sing in my office in upstate New York, what place can we also make for deliberately low bandwidth versions 
in light of these glaring inequalities laid bare by COVID. My second kind of related point that I want to raise is the issue of honest citation, which we've also been talking about in this symposium. And here again, I blame that troubling and troublesome commonplace that real rigorous work can only happen through hands-on study of physical books. Let's be honest, that commonplace incentivizes citational lying. When digital resources exist, people are going to use them. And when it comes time to publish, if they think that it shows their work is not sufficiently rigorous, people will lie and cite the physical object instead. Through the leadership of the Medieval Academy and Lisa Fagan Davis and Rupika Rissam and Reviews in Digital Humanities, we are entering an exciting new stage for rigorous peer review for digital projects. I think we can go it one step further, not just for digital projects, but for any writing and work that engages with them. When someone is publishing using manuscripts, any of us engaged at any level in the peer review process can ask them to be honest in their citations about what they used, physical, digital, some combination thereof, and then we can reward their honesty. We need to remove the class professional shame of relying on digital manuscripts. COVID is awful. So many people have died. My students have lost family. I have lost family. Many of you likely have as well. And many more of us will experience long-term disability from this global catastrophe and its colossal political mismanagement. I don't mean to be such a killjoy. I don't actually want to be a buzzkill. But I do think these contexts of inequality are important and I don't want us to lose sight of them. The truth is that I would like to think manuscript studies can wring some good out of this crisis. In the face of the hard truths about our field that COVID forces us to examine anew, I hope we can break our own bad habits. Let us begin to be more honest with each other about class, about disability, about lasting digital inequalities. Let us finally begin to be real and authentic with each other in ways that we have not perhaps allowed ourselves before. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Bridget. Um, and thirdly, we have Eric. Yeah, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm speaking to you from downtown Vancouver, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Slowtooth people. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you. And um, I will share some thoughts I had uh, about the papers and some uh, sort of personal injections, uh, interjections as well. Um, I miss you all terribly, and it's great to see you on the screen, but it's just a screen, but you know, it is what it is, I guess. I miss the, uh, the buzz of the conference room and, and the buzz of the coffee room after, where most uh, uh, interesting conversations were mostly happening. Um, so living in the Pacific time zone, I had to wake up quite early this morning. Uh, to get ready for today's uh, session. And as I walked our dog through a thankfully, thankfully dry west end of the city, I thought with considerable excitement about the papers of today. And then two questions popped into my head. And this is actually true because I wrote my response in the two hour break, um, having to deal as director with some <laughs> emergencies yesterday. Um, question one. Would a pandemic in 2010 have seen the kind of manuscript studies possibilities that we currently are presented with in 2020? And two, would a pandemic in 2030 see more of these possibilities than today? I think these are fascinating questions. I, I can't say enough about them because I only have a few minutes, but still. Um, I also like to use the sort of the theme of today to ask a third question, which is more ext existential existential uh, in nature, uh, which is how has digital scholarship influenced what manuscript studies today is? So first to first, um, 2010, what would it have looked like then? Um, when I started by turning over New Leaf Project in Leiden in 2010, um, there were very limited things I could do with digital materials. So 
digitally interfacing with manuscripts could be done, but only for certain pockets in Europe. So the project that I started was interested in a European phenomenon, and I could get some information from certain countries, but certainly not the widespread that we can get to very easily with a few clicks today. And I think that's a, a marvelous uh, jump forward. And it has, it has, of course, it's sparked by the increase of digitization, but it's also um, a much broader will of libraries across the board to present more of their materials online against great cost. The problem with these pockets of information, so pockets of uh, digitized manuscripts, is that they're often uh, related to certain countries and regions because of libraries in those regions being forward thinking in digitizing. And a good example is the British Library. So in a very early stage, you could uh, see digitized manuscripts or part thereof or snippets of pages, as long as there was color on it <laughs> uh, in the beginning. And, um, but that got you a lot of English material. But I wasn't interested necessarily only in English materials. And so that was a, a very a big challenge. Um, so pragmatic issues that I encountered is um, few manuscripts were available in full and that's different today. The interface was a bit clumsy, which is different today. The resolution was low, not enough to zoom in on letters, which is also thankfully very different today. Um, and the other big thing is you could look at it, we could publish it. Which, is, uh, which I got so mad about so many times. Um, and that is changing as well today, slowly. I think it's one of the last things that is moving forward with great speed. Um, other projects that started in 2010, for example, Peter Stokes DigiPal had sort of similar issues with images. Where do we get them? Uh, how do we get the resolution up? What can, what can we do with them? How can we publish them? So that was an interesting period because at conferences, it was often very pragmatic. How do we do this? And that's sort of, it's almost a little bit disappeared now. We, we don't have those conversations so much anymore because things are actually rolling very well and nicely. Um, digitally interfacing with medieval manuscripts today is also different in that manuscript pages published in the digital forum um, are sort of also deliberately catered to a broader audience. So it's often paid for by libraries or paid for by projects. But now there is this big component of a non-expert that might also be viewing these images. And therefore, uh, I think that more so than in the past, uh, image collections, digitized manuscripts are more carefully sort of contextualized. And we've seen examples of that today as well with, for example, the um, uh, vocabularies that are made in the, in the Getty project. Um, that it seems so normal now, but in my recollection, and even though it's only 10 years ago, it's a bit fuzzy in the past, as it always is. Um, that was not the case back then. So deep connections with uh, digital manuscripts and the world outside academia, we've seen in old papers. Um, so Kim and Alicia uh, talked about the K-12 school project uh, that benefit from their efforts. Um, we've, uh, um, Joanna has talked about how teachers still have access. Um, to uh, manuscripts in a time when other things, other people have sort of uh, stopped having access to those materials. And uh, I also think Bill's video of sort of gilding um, is an example of that extra thing that you do to make things interesting for an audience beyond your own sort of group of scholars. And so I would, so this part like to, to, to emphasize here that I think it's very important that we keep on thinking about these non-experts in our efforts of digitizing. Should never forget that because this is my firm belief. I see it as a payback in kind for the tax money that we use. So it's often that these images are made for our purpose, for our benefit as scholars. But I think the other part, the flip side is super, super important. So we need, to, we need to give something back and that taps into social media in doing outreach of all kinds to schools, et cetera. All the things that are so, so important these days. So this is a bit of a shoe in. Um, manuscript studies would have been severely limited in 2010 uh, pandemic. Uh, we probably could have done less because we lean more on in situ studies, studies that we do now. 
and uh, a general public would have less things to look at. It's a bit of a, a weird conclusion, but, but bear with me. We'll, we're getting more sophisticated in a moment, hopefully. Um, and, and I think it's projects like the Florentine Codex Initiative and Bill's work on 3D imaging processing that have made this shift possible. Be very important for that. The second question, will a pandemic in 2030 uh, be even less limiting than we currently are? So is, that, is there more that we can do in 10 years? I'm not gonna talk about this because it's speculating. And I think it's very clear that there are many great things about to happen. And again, I'd like to point out uh, Bill's paper um, and the shift in the discussion that we talked about going from virtual reality to, to uh, artificial int intelligence, um, or was it the other way around? Well, the inter how those two are connected, <laughs> I think it's the other way around. Um, so there are many things on the horizon and we can see the first signals at the moment. And so I, this is, not even nobody would take a bet against this but in 2030 we're doing more things digitally in things that we probably can't even phantom uh, right now so i'd like to end with that third question which i actually find the most interesting one how has digital scholarship influenced what manuscript studies today is and i'm going beyond the papers of today i'm going to make some general statement and i'm going to end with a really provocative claim which will hopefully generate some questions and discussion. Um, so, first of all, Joanna showed the digital manuscript on oh, right, which is great, and I agree. And combined with our great reliance as scholars on digital manuscripts, it can be argued that our field is studying a different object than it was 10 years ago. Manuscript studies now centers on digital objects, which is a very pragmatic and profound shift, which happened, I think, over the last 10 years. There's no precise year you can say, and here it's happened. But I think if you compare it to jumping back 10 years, you can say it didn't happen here yet. Um, second, perhaps as a result of the new object we study, as more studies and projects in manuscript studies become digital studies and projects in manuscript studies, traditional, let's say analog projects are taking a step back. So we've lost something along the way, I think. Not saying it's good or bad, just observing. Examples, it's hard to think of an example because you can always say, oh, but there's a digital tool for this. But I think um, if I say the scriptorium study, for example, that synthesizes the writing style and codological practices of its scribes, even when all those uh, manuscripts are digitized of the single scriptorium, and even if there's tools to understand better what the ruling patterns are, what I don't see at the moment is the next step that is to use all the digital data to write a synthesis as it used to be done in the not so old days. Not saying we have to do that, that we have to do that, but I'm just saying that that next step would be a very, very interesting one to take with all the data in the same project, in the same instance, take an extra step. But we often seem to stop um, when the tool has been refined or when the data has been dug up. And I, I miss sometimes seeing that extra dimension. Uh, another example is uh, studies in the development of a script or regional writing styles. This used to be very big in journals and books, etc. And it's sort of is disappearing. This is a completely natural process, I think, as new technologies and methodologies arrive in a discipline, existing methodologies and questions may take a step back or bow out. This is a completely natural process within academia and, and our interests as human beings. Um, but there are trickle down effects too, given the limited people power in the disciplines of manuscript study, it also means a shift in the research hours spent on either the analog or digital kind of uh, question, just to I call it analog as an oppose, to oppose it to, to digital, if you see what I mean. And as a consequence of this, there are shifts downstream, for example, in the kind of publications that appear in journals and books. So it starts at the top and it sort of has an enormous influence on the field as such. And so it changes. So digital, our interests and abilities to do better in digital ways um, has, a, has a profound influence on the full breadth of our, of our discipline, I think. At the third, uh, new threads and areas of attention have emerged. Uh, threads that are unique to digital environment and which not necessarily tap into existing focus points or research questions that we traditionally found important for the field. So it's not so, so in, 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 in some disciplines, 
the next step builds on the previous one. Here, that is the case as well, but there's also a whole field of possibilities of starting something new without having roots in the past, if you see what I mean, which is interesting as a, as a disciplinary uh, sort of development. A notable example, digital projects often are deeply involved in solving technological problems and potentials. The skeptic would say, what does this have to do with manuscript studies? I'm not one of those, but, but you can see how that's interesting as a phenomenon. So questions, for example, how can we best present a manuscript in digital form? Um, how can we make our software or hardware do X, Y, Z? Um, we had examples in all three papers, finding a software application that allows the user to search for a dog in a digitized page. Phenomenally interesting uh, question and, uh, and the, the road to, uh, uh, to solution is also very interesting. How may we touch a digital manuscript, Joanna? And how can we turn virtual reality into artificial reality? Yes, Bill, looking at you. Was that right this time? <laughs> Um, we feel, so, so this is my end, um, we feel as scholars these changes in different ways. Claim, it's arguably harder today than 10 years ago to get funding for projects that include no digital dynamic, no research tool, digital research tool, no digital component online. I think it's harder. And uh, digital problems, potentials and uncertainties where they need to be defended in research proposals in 2010, I remember explaining why digital manuscript would give me the same answers as one that I would look at in a library in my proposal that I wrote in 2009, which was aborted in 2010. Um, so those uh, things that would have to be defended in the past have now been elevated to the main topic of research proposals, right? So the, so the problem has, the problem that could hold you down has become a problem that actually is the drive behind your research, which is super interesting. So what was a tool has come to grow into an actual project, as it were. And so to end with a provoking question, I debated whether I should put this in or not. So let's just keep it among ourselves. <laughs> Are we witnessing a shift from digital humanities being an auxiliary or supporting discipline to manuscript studies, to manuscript studies being auxiliary or supporting discipline for digital humanities. Thank you. Um, so thank you to all three panelists um, for your reflections on today's uh, sessions, as well as offering your own powerful perspectives on the moment we're in during this pandemic. Um, so let's, jump right in. Um, put any questions you have in the chat. Um, I think Nick is going to keep an eye out and see who has questions. And um, if you are one of the presenters from this morning too, it'd be great to hear what um, your responses to these reflections are. And also I would say questions among, I mean, conversation among the three, uh, the three speakers who just we just heard from. I'm sure, I'm sure someone has a question. I actually have a question or a thought. Speak. <laughs> Is that, can I go? Um, it speaks to a little bit what Eric was just saying this morning. I can't remember what it was, but as, as some of you know, and we talked a little bit about this on Wednesday, uh, Penn Libraries is leading the planning grant for Digital Scriptorium. And we have been emphasizing less data versus more data uh, in terms of building a national union catalog. You know, like you, you don't wanna have too much data because it makes it hard, harder to, to do the thing that Digital Scriptorium aims to do, which is find manuscripts. But today I was thinking, uh, like how am I, I get my, 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 the short version of my question is what, if, what is the effect of digitization on manuscript description? And what I mean by that is if we have images up there as we're describing a manuscript, as we're doing the metadata uh, for it in a digital catalog, what are we gonna lose? Like, are we going to note the difference between 
dry point ruling versus ink or the line starts above the line or it starts below the line, the first line. You know, these like little differences that when you didn't have the luxury of having, always having an image next to the thing that you're describing in a publication, you know, you would note, um, which led to very lengthy catalog descriptions that are hard to read. They're not, they can be sort of dense and hard to get into and follow. But there was this art of manuscript description. It's like very careful looking. And so as someone who, you know, I kind of believe that for digital scriptorium, for example, we do need less data, not more, but are we giving up this art of description? Are we gonna sacrifice this art of description of close looking, um, of close reading? Because these tools now let us say, okay, you, okay, reader, okay, user, here's the image. You can look for all the other stuff yourself, but you know, here's how you find this manuscript. So I'll leave that there and, and uh, for other people to comment on. And, and it sort of speaks to what Eric said about just like, what are, you know, what are we sacrificing with this? Is manuscript studies becoming uh, a servant to the sort of digital production of our data? See, that is sort of what, where my mind went because I don't think it's that we, don't want to describe in that much detail. It's how, it's what kind of data you put that description into. My body keeps disappearing. I'm sorry if this is <laughs> kind of weird. Um, but like, because if you put, if you take all of that information and you put it in a database that you can search, then you can do things like, okay, tell me how many manuscripts in this collection, you know, have a line above the, the top line and how many of them don't which isn't even something that you can do in a description that's written out as a narrative description that you read. So intensive description isn't necessarily a sort of traditional description. It could be data that you put in a field. And then there's a whole other conversation to talk about what that does, you know, versus it's just a whole, it's just a different kind of thing that you can do different, different um, kinds of work with. You can do, um, you know, quality, Quant qualitative, quantitative work that you can't do um, if yeah, you just have written text. Of, of course, like I like, I understand that, but I guess my question is like for manuscript studies, are we going to lose this art of description that so much of the, you know, last century, century and a half that uh, paleographic and codicological description, are we going to lose that? But you know, Board yeah. and teach people. <laughs> I mean, I think in some ways we kind of already have. Um, if I, I, I'm looking at different copies of Hockley copied across about 600 years right now. Um, and one of the things that's really striking to me about the print facsimile that was put out by the Early English Text Society right before the Early English Text Society stopped putting out print editions or print facsimiles because they said they didn't need to because everything was digital. Um, is that all of the book reviews that are coming out about this facsimile praise the editorial apparatus, praise that catalogers eye, that careful art of close looking and description and it's pages and pages and pages and it's beautiful. Um, and the digital copies that we have of Hockley's manuscripts don't have that really the same way. Some of them do, many of them don't. Um, and I, that's a loss that I'm really interested in. Um, I think I think it's happening, and I'm wondering about ways that we might begin to push back on it. Although that's different, maybe than the light, agile, less metadata system. If there was a way to keep those separate somehow, I don't know. Sorry, Eric. Um, just returning to Lynn's original question. Um... I was thinking a very interesting uh, thing you bring up and I was thinking about looking at a manuscript description in the age where we all have images at our um, disposal here in front of computers. Um, I think an important part of a cataloger is to make decisions. This is written above top line versus below top line. This is uh, ink uh, ruling, which is actually very difficult to see. I find I make mistakes um, mm -hmm. all the time. Um, so the catalog describer makes these decisions is an authority. 
And if you just present sort of the images and a very rudimentary description, it seems to me that a lot of things can go wrong along the way. And also um, it's sort of, uh, you sort of assume that the user of the catalog has the same expert knowledge as you do, which I think you can't. And even more so, I don't think you should. Because uh -huh. for example, it rules out students. Students learning in a class, uh, you can give them a catalog and you can ask them to do a mini uh, quantitative uh, study on you know, the size of the page, for example. Uh, oh, that's, that's sort of pretty easy to measure, I guess. But say uh, above top line, uh, which is not always easy to see because the prickings are not always easy there and, uh, and the ruling is sometimes fuzzy. Uh, so I, I would strongly argue for maintaining our high standards and just seeing that in addition to very solid manuscript description, we now also can see the actual manuscript. I see them as almost as two different things, even though they're sometimes presented at the same, in the same location. Um, we had um, someone with a hand up, I think, Kim, Kim Richter with a question. I can't hear you. Oh, there, oh, there we go. You were muted. I don't think she is muted. No, now you're. No, we just can't. We know we can't hear you, but you don't have the unmuted. Maybe if you type your question or comment in the chat, and then Nick, somebody can read it out. Oh, give me a second. Oh, oh now, now we can hear, hear you, you now. <laughs> Good. Um, so, first of all, thank you to the three commentators. I, I took a lot of notes, so um, to take uh, sort of back home, literally, <laughs> um, and, and uh, to discuss with the team. Um, I really appreciate the comment about, um, I really like the comments um, that Dot and Bridget had about digital discrimination and sort of the lack of internet and uh, for our Digital Florentine Codex, we do think, especially not just in the United States, but also we're thinking of audiences in Mexico and indigenous audiences that maybe don't even, you know, have electricity in certain areas that I've been to, you know. So how, um, so I'm, so that that limitation is really um, at the forefront of my mind. And yet I don't know that I have a good solution because I do think that it does provide more access than the physical one. I mean, you, you, um, you, Bridget, you pointed out sort of the luxury of my desk, right? That, that that I'm fully aware of, you know, to be able to have all those books uh, even on one desk. Um, so I don't know. I, I I think I would sort of like to think about what then does that mean? The like what are what are solutions then to, you know, if we can't reach everybody with um, through the digital, because of these limitations, then, then what what would be the solution? Has anybody come up with a better solution? Um, and at the Getty, we, we have sort of a new mandate to have digital first. We want to push digital out more than ever content. Um, and of course, now during the pandemic, that has become an even higher sort of imperative. But um, I think it, it's very good to keep in mind that we aren't reaching everybody and that there are limitations but then what is then the solution to that that's what i keep wondering um and i also like uh what eric said about the the pockets of access you know back in 2010 and um for our uh, k through 12 teachers workshop i did um i did sort of like a mini survey i went through all the libraries that i could think of that had digitized their pre-Hispanic and early colonial manuscripts and put them into a massive list um, so that the teachers would have it. And then I sort of realized that there isn't also like a place where there's like a one clearinghouse where you can find all these manuscripts. I mean, there are sort of some for our field. Um, Mexico, for example, has done sort of a combination of, um, sort of combined manuscripts that have been digitized in other places. But in a way, it's sort of like my mental map of where these things are that I then put together for the teachers. And so you have to sort of sometimes know which are the places that have ties them. And most many, many places are, but not everybody is. And so anyway, so so these these issues of access are very much in the forefront of uh, my mind. And I would love to hear what you all um, who dealt with digital manuscripts much longer than I have have um, 
Do you have any solutions? Um, but I'm going to continue my theme of being a buzzkill. I don't think we can make things that serve everyone. Um, and I think in some ways that's what my objection to digital democratization narratives is, is we have limits. We make things that have limits. We pick and choose our audiences. Um, and I love what Eric is saying about those choices and funding involving us in um, very like ethical owing our, our general publics and future students and future manuscript scholars access. Um, I think maybe one step is to stop saying digital democratization narratives. Um, like we need to stop saying that. We need to be more honest about who we're making these things for. And that's a terrible thing to ask for because grant, grant funding committees don't wanna hear that. Like they wanna hear that this will serve everyone. Um, but being a bit more honest in the narrowness. Um, one quick side note that I'm gonna stop talking. I think this is the person I saw talking at a text technologies colloquium at Stanford several years ago. Um, he was doing work on um, digitizing resources at the American Philosophical Society and then getting copies to indigenous groups in the Pacific Northwest. So he might be someone to look into and, and connect with that. Um, I'm gonna stop talking now so my other panelists can. Yeah, I was thinking something along those lines too, that you know, you can build things that will serve many audiences, you know, you know, many audiences, but there are some audiences that are that are special. Um, and you know, the the Native American example, I think is a is a really good one. If you um, there's even software um, I know that's been developed and I'm blanking on the name of it. If, if somebody else knows the name of it, please put it in the chat and I'll try to think of it. Um, but it's um, essentially a repository software that was developed specifically for Native American communities um, because they're the items, you know, that they have um, are special to them. Um, and so maybe not everybody should have, um, you know, we talk a lot about openness and openness is a huge part of, of, of what we think is very important, but sometimes you don't want things to be open. And so the technological needs need to reflect those um, cultural needs. And so there's a whole other, a whole other thing. And so it is, I think Bridget and I sort of naive to say this can serve everybody because, you know, one person might be studying something for a, you know, a one reason and for somebody else, it's a very different, more personal reason. Um, and so being honest and saying, we're gonna build, we're gonna build a thing to serve this audience that might actually be tiny, uh, but very important um, for that. And that's all I'm gonna say, because this is just stuff that I have absorbed. I've never actually worked on a project like that, but I think it's, a, I do think it's a really important thing to keep in mind. And uh, Michelle Warren has dropped it. It's Mercatu. The link is in the, that's the software I was thinking of. Thank you, Michelle. There's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion in the chat, but it's not necessarily <laughs> questions for the speakers. Uh, maybe if, if someone has a question, they can put, raise their hand or re post paste it or just uh, speak up. Uh, maybe it's the future of scholarly discussion. It, a it, parallel a sidebar chat. Sidebar. <laughs> sidebar. Or they can they can uh, bring the bring the conversation to us. They don't necessarily have to ask a question, I suppose. I suppose of course everyone can see the chat. Um, I had a question um, for Alicia and Kim that I didn't get a chance to ask earlier. Um, if if it'd be all right if I would ask that now. Um, I you talked a little bit about the summaries um, that were being done by Eduardo de la Cruz Cruz of the contemporary uh, Nahuatl uh, translate or in, in contemporary Nahuatl. And I was wondering um, if contemporary speakers of Nahuatl can read the Nahuatl transcriptions, um, generally speaking, um, and if you'd given thought on how to engage um, with speakers of contemporary Nahuatl. 
in your project? Um, yeah, so the the um, contemporary Nawa speakers, A, there are multiple Nawa uh, variants. So, and in some cases, um, they're, um, I don't know, I don't want to say mutually unintelligible, but they're, they're, they're quite distinctive. Um, and so, so maybe it's sort of to the degree that it, an Italian speaker could, you know, speak with a Spanish speaker and they could sort of understand each other, but maybe not sort of entirely fluently. And so the similar is true also for the classical Nahuatl. Um, so this is would be sort of like, you know, as if they were reading old English or something like this. Right. Um, and so it's, it's actually quite difficult for contemporary Nawa speakers to read classical Nawa. And one of the complicating factors is also the orthography that is uh, Spanish orthography in the 16th century. Um, and so currently they use a different orthographic system typically. And so there are sort of many compounding issues there, sort of like regional variants, the temporal distance, uh, like ortho orthographic issues. So the Eastern Huasteca Nahuatl is the most common uh, Nahuatl variant. And so, and this is also the variant that um, most of us on the team have learned because EDS, that where um, Eduardo is the director, that is the school that teaches a lot of scholars in the field. So sort of we're hitting lots of indigenous speakers, but also um, scholars who are learning contemporary Nahuatl. Um, and so, um, so precisely those summaries were made in order to give, um, for example, Eduardo students, because he also teaches in the Huasteca indigenous um, fellow Nawa students. Um, he teaches them in, you know, like the high school, because some of them are bilingual. And so he uses those summaries to teach the history of the conquest. And we've specifically focused on book 12. We don't have the summaries for all 12 books um, because the um, other books would be somewhat more difficult to um, summarize because it's more encyclopedic information where you have like these entries. So it's very hard to summarize. Book 12 is a history. And so that lent itself to a different treatment. Um, and so we definitely had um, the indigenous audiences in mind um, for, for that, for those summaries. And so, yes, and we're, we're working directly with Eduardo um, for, you know, and then like engaging him and then he's engaging with Nawa communities. So, yes. Oh, thank you. I have a question for my fellow panelists, um, riffing off of what Dot was saying about fun which I think is delightful. See, I'm trying to stop being a buzzkill. Um, like this, and, and Eric, one of the things I really associate with you in addition to intense scholarly rigor is a real skill at outreach and making things fun. And I'd love to hear both of you talk a little bit more about, I don't know, the tension between scholarliness and fun, or maybe they're not a binary, maybe they're like a double helix, um, but I'd love to, to ask you to just hold forth a bit more on that, both of you. Well, dots, shall I start? Yes, I want to hear what you say, <laughs> please. You know, I think uh, doing social stuff is a lot of fun, uh, but I also think research is a lot of fun. And actually at the moment, I think doing administration is a lot of fun too, but I never thought I would say that, but it's actually, it's actually fun in a different way, arguably. Um, I find it super important that we all try to do our own thing beyond academia. And I've said this in many different ways in different presentations and whatnot, uh, in our own way. So some people are just not the kind that blog easily or want to or can be funny on Twitter or entertaining or you don't have the time for it. That's, I appreciate that also. But we can in our own way perhaps try to uh, and, and, and as little capacity as, as necessary. Um, but uh, most important, I find that we have that drive as scholars, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that many of us do. And I think that's the upside, of course, of digitization and our whole digital thing in our field, that that is the drive behind everything. I think, well, behind many things that we do in social media, it's now possible. I don't think 
somebody would have thought, let's scan this black and white image and then see if we can do something with that little grainy picture that we now have. So it's so easy to do. So please, let's all do it. Um, the, the, the downside of it is, and this is, uh, since we're uh, among the 63 <laughs> intimately here in the room, um, I did it for many, many years since uh, I started in 2012 and stopped tweeting pictures in 2019. Um, I all, at a certain point I thought, okay, now I've done everything that I want to do on Twitter with images. Now I just want to listen to other people. <laughs> so that was a really interesting moment. Uh, and it came actually, uh, I can still remember, I sat on the bench uh, at UBC, I sent out four pictures per day and I had great fun in all my breaks, putting them ready in buffer and then they would shoot out automatically, it's fantastic. And at a certain point I thought, I think I've said everything that I want to say. <laughs> Um, on Twitter. And then, and then uh, oddly enough, half a year later, the same thing happened with my blog, blogging. So, uh, I, so I was never one to blog uh, sort of in a fluffy way, but wanted to do research blog posts. It was perhaps fatal for me uh, because it takes a long time, but I couldn't get myself uh, motivated enough to tackle another topic, which I really disappointed in myself, but I've now made peace with it. And I've sort of moved on a little bit, although not with the other dynamic, and this is, well, I'll stop talking and dot and take over. Uh, the sort of uh, public lecturing and for kids in school, I still do that frequently. Um, it's the other side of being public as a scholar. Um, also not for everybody, also with its own challenges, but that is, I find at the moment, a, a very rewarding dynamic in being social as a researcher. Dot of you. Okay, so I'm going to, I think, riff a little bit on something that you said um, sort of earlier in your, in your comments um, um, about, you know, focusing on things that are sort of outside of um, the work that we do. Um, and I have a hobby, and I'm going to tell you all my hobby, a lot of you already know this. I'm involved in fandom and I write fan fiction. Um, and it's really fun uh to do and it's actually it, it's actually made my work more fun and that i've been able to sort of take things that i've learned working in a fandom space and take bringing it into my um into the into this sort of academic space one way is through social media so i i've been doing social media for for pen sort of you know for some sort of on and off since I got here um, like seven or eight years ago. And I used to be very uncomfortable. I'm still not actually the best um, at Twitter and I'm not tweeting a lot right now except for the Sims account. Um, but fandom is very much a social media thing. And so learning how to like use GIFs and everybody now, you, I, think, I think a lot of people now are like a lot more comfortable in this sort of social media space, but, I, but like learning how to talk to people through social media and communicate um, is, is really important. And I feel like doing that in fandom was helpful. Um, and in the past year, last year, I started doing research on, actually doing research that was influenced by things that I'd been thinking about in a fandom space. One thing that you do a lot uh, in fandom is something called um, trans transformative works, like writing fanfic. Um, and there's actually a, um, uh, or has been a movement for a few years in uh, academic spaces in taking the, um, the language of fandom and applying it to historical texts. So just describe, you can find articles, scholarly articles talking about say the Arthurian legends as uh, fan fiction. And so I have done a little bit of work looking not at the texts as themselves, but manuscripts as a kind of fan fiction. And I've been looking at books of hours, specifically books of hours, not things that I've, manuscripts that I've really been interested in until it, you know, it occurred to me and Nick Herman, thank, you know, thankfully when I talked to him about this, he didn't tell me I was being very silly. He actually said this is a thing that makes sense in the sense that, you know, there are texts that people took and, and changed and did things with them. Um, the important thing about fandom and fan fiction, of course, is that you do it because you love it because you're kind of a fanatic about it. Um, and you can apply that to books of hours in ways that you can't 
I think, to other types of texts. The love is the important part um, there. And so it's an interesting kind of thing to think about how this has happened. And one thing that I, that I haven't done a lot of, which I'd like to do, um, is to think more, I said even when I started my comments earlier about how I like stories and I like to tell stories. And so telling, taking the, the, the information that we have about how manuscripts, you know, taking a manuscript and saying, okay, here's how it was made and here's what happened to it and here how, here's how it was now and figuring out a way to tell that as a story. Um, so it's not just descriptive, but it's actually, you know, it, again, you know, what uh, Joe was sort of bringing in the things that Johanna and Bill were talking about, this sort of emotional, emotional part of it and making that part of it. Um, so Bridget, aren't you glad you asked? So I'm gonna stop talking now. I'm tremendously glad I asked. And actually, as you were both talking, I was thinking, you know, fun and pleasure and, you know, you, you used the L word, you said love. And it strikes me that these are underlying features of all of our presentations this morning. Um, so I'd love to like draw in Joanna and Bill and Kim and just, can I make you talk about fun next too? This is great. I mean, I will go for it, Bill. You've got your hand up, go for it. <laughs> um, I, I love this chat. I think once of the one of the big things for me with fun is talking to other people about your experiences with manuscripts and having fun with that. Now me and Dot and Bridget have talked about this a lot, but I've had this obsession for a while of what does a manuscript actually taste like? Like if you licked it, what does it taste like? And we've joked about this so much on social media that our head of special collections came up to me about six months ago and was like, please, please don't lick the manuscripts. Okay, Joanna, like she was genuinely concerned that I was finally going to break and do it. Yeah. And I've never, <laughs> I've never done that. We've talked about it. I think any of us have done it. We should not do it. And yet somebody who was doing their PhD in Leicester, Armando Filippo, um, put on an exhibition, I think about two or three years ago, in which audience members could come and actually taste and feel and use the elements that go into making a manuscript. So he took this idea of consuming the text and completely opened it up. That kind of chat, I'm all for. Um, I think the, the other fun thing that I do with my work is that um, my, my uncle is a calligrapher. So he's part of a calligraphy group in the Northeast of England. Um, and I think once he realized what I was doing for a living, he was like, oh, we should we should do something together. So for the past, I think, five or so years, I've been going back down to Sunderland, which is where I'm from, to lead sessions with this group of calligraphers on a different manuscript. And I present it and talk about it and think about the script. And then they have a go at copying it out. And it's the most amazing thing to do just to see, to learn from that practice and to have fun with them and to open up these collections to a whole new audience. Um, but yeah, licking manuscripts, calligraphy, that's my fun. <laughs> well, and if I can, you know, just kind of add to that, I think it's right in kind of the same line. Um, <clears throat> the other day, my wife asked me, I was telling her about a grant that Joanna and I are applying for with VR. And she says, you're supposed to be an academic. You're not supposed to be having fun all the time. And I think that, you know, a lot of what I've done has been motivated by intrigue, mystery, and fun. And I find, you know, like the turning of the pages of the British Library that Joanne showed earlier, I see that as fun from the perspective, is the magic of turning a page is revelation. What's on that next page? And although I think they could, you know, make it more dramatic, they don't. But still, you know, I think it's the monks themselves, I think, had a better sense of play than what we think they did. And so, you know, I, when we look in the margins, especially I work early medieval, which they don't tend to think about as so much play. But in the Book of Kells, I think there's a lot of play going on. So I think celebrating that sense of play and just experiencing these manuscripts, I also constantly feel lucky, even when I'm looking at a digital image that's a poor digital image, that this thing survived. 
what's the likelihood that this was going to survive all the years till now? So I think when something does that, it invites, I think, a sense of play and light. Light is a sense of play for me. I've always liked to watch light reflect off of water. And I think illuminate the manuscripts give me that, gives me that opportunity to watch that reflection in different ways. And that play of light to me is, I was gonna say this would be corny like a monk would say, but it's, you know, it's a play of angels. It's a play of dogs. It's a play of all sorts of things. Uh, and, you know, it, it's like, you know, my lab has found that she loves to chase golf balls. And she will come up when I'm working at my desk and literally she'll start by sitting beside me, looking up at me. If I don't get up, she starts pushing on me with her nose. Then if I don't respond, she starts pawing on me until I take her out to hit four or five golf balls for and she gets to chase them. So she's totally hooked on golf. And I think there's something about just the joy and wonder of our work. And I think we're very lucky to be able to play with manuscripts like we do. Well, and I, I think of um, fun on similar levels, but um, for pre-Columbian and uh, early colonial Me Mexican manuscripts, there's also the fun that you can sort of like almost, I mean, sometimes it's very serious knowledge that's uh, contained within, but you can also sort of see a level of fun that the artists had. So um, they, they work a lot with, um, you know, rebuses and uh, sort of like uh, the, the pict pictographs, they are really sort of like literal riddles. And it's really fun to sort of see how they go about encoding language with these um, pictographs. So a, a fun one that I um, like and that I always teach is that um, the you know they they make little hill signs and then they put little animals on top to represent a name, but then there are also odd things like disembodied teeth that then are stuck to the hill, and those teeth represent um, the the suffix plan. Um, because that means place of. And so it's, I think those sorts of like visual puns and so on, it's, it's, that's very fun. And then the other thing that for me has given me so much joy with um, these manuscripts um, was really, you know, the Florentine Codex is so canonical and we think we know it so well in our field. And, and yet, um, and, and, and I'm working with people who are the, you know, specialists who've worked on this for many, many years. And then when we come together and, and look at this material and we're discovering new things about this manuscript because now we have better access to it and we've gone and looked at it in person. And, um, but also like having this, this immediacy of the images that we're paying a lot of attention to and really being able to zoom in and look at them and blowing them up. So in my presentation, I showed you the, the blow up of the bees, you know, like you look at them at a manuscript page, but then to look at them as almost like, um, um, you know, monumental landscape painting, that's, I think, find that really fun. And you look at those images in a really different way. And this also, of course, makes me think of, Bill, what you were talking about, sort of the different ways of like going even deeper and looking at them at the, the, the you know, like the, the, with the microscope and look at the, at the pigments and the layering and the chipping of the pigments. I think that is also sort of this, this um, level of access. And, you know, I deal with uh, actually, I'm actually a pre-Columbianist. I'm not even a manuscripts person. I'm not even a colonial person. Um, so I deal with cultures for which we don't have writing. We don't have manuscripts. We have we have material culture. And so in a way, it's this luxury of being able to deal with texts and images and having such, you know, like a plethora. But um, I, I also think it's so um, great to uncover knowledge that we sort of maybe don't necessarily immediately have access to. And then having this technological um, art history or technological manuscript studies, which give us sort of this, a, such a deep understanding of these manuscripts that we really haven't until now 
been able to get at. And we, we it's, it's like a, a brand new world opens up um, and explodes. And I mean, like I'm getting goosebumps just like talking about it because it's so much fun. Uh, pigments is just like, I love pigments. I could talk about pigments or listen to people talking about pigments day in and day out. I, I guess um, I'll add to this fun. Um, and I'm going to add the fun of being on this incredible team, this Florentine Codex team and working with all these incredible colleagues who find fun in uh, every time, every discovery. And what I, I mean is like from, you know, we've pre-COVID, our team almost went to a local Mesoamerican ball game. Um, and this, this came out of an interest that our intern had to learn about the traditional ball game. And um, you know, I also think about the, the um, work that Berenice Gaillemont did looking at hip hop today, Nahuatl uh, language hip hop, and sharing that with the teachers in the LA Unified School District. And, and I also, you know, the really exciting outcomes of these uh, K through 12 lessons plan lesson plans. There's uh, incredible, uh, playful, and, you know, also uh, really um, educational material that came out of that. Um, and uh, yes, identifying the hands. I mean, these are games for um, for our team. This is what what we you know want to do on a on a Sunday morning. Um, and uh, also, I, I think about Eduardo in Zacatecas and the possibility that he's going to use these contemporary Nahuatl summaries to um, engage the youth in his community um, when he's teaching the conquest, which is something he's spoken to us about. Um, and, and then this leads me to think about the question, Bridget, that you um, brought up, you know, are these low bandwidth examples of how we're moving outside of the digital and the limitations um, with digital uh, quality, so. Any other uh, questions uh, from from the panel, from beyond about about previous days as well, uh, as we as we kind of uh, move towards towards wrapping things up. Uh, Eric. Yeah. <clears throat> so the big question is: once we can all go out again safely. Um, what will happen to our uh, conference uh, sort of practice. Um, and I, for one, would love for this conference to remain online or to have a, maybe that's too much to ask, have an online component that is very interactive as well. Um, Although having hybrid conferences is, is a difficult. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'm just thinking that at UBC, we have a pledge that you only travel so many times per year. And I made that pledge. So um, I would love to uh, participate in this conference and others as well. And I hope that uh, sort of the thing that we've been doing for a half year now will stay in place and that there will be opportunities to do this, what we're doing now online with a large group. Yeah, there's definitely um, a lot of advantages to this. And one of the things that that I'm glad that we really did was the virtual lightning round because traditionally the symposium, you know, we invite people to speak. We kind of come up with a list of various people we want to talk about a certain theme. And this was the first time that we've kind of like opened up a call and it with fantastic results, right? So there's, there is that. Um, we love our in-person event, but, but yeah, I agree with you. There's something about having somehow trying to like work in this online component. So it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds and it's something that I think we'll definitely be thinking about at Sims. Well, it shows also that the there is a very large audience interested beyond those who have the means or the yeah. will or the time to travel. Yeah. And Zoom has made it incredibly easy to download the recordings and I can put them up within two hours. Um, so there, you know, so even if you can't make it because you live in Australia, and I don't know what time of the day or night it is in Australia right now, but uh, you can at least catch the 
you know, the symposium kind of as it's happening. Um, and I, I think that's been a wonderful feature. Um, I think I might have everyone stop here for a minute and thank all of our speakers just for today, especially, and for the whole symposium. I think this has been a fantastic event. I'm very pleased with how it's turned out. I didn't know how it was gonna work and I think it's it's worked really well. And I think that's due to the hard work of, uh, of our invited speakers, of the people who did the uh, video recordings and especially to the Schoenberg Institute team. Go Schoenberg Institute, we, we did it, we can relax. Um, or I can relax, I don't know, maybe you guys have all been relaxed throughout this whole thing. But anyway, it's been a fantastic event and, and especially to everyone who has uh, participated, who's been coming, showing up and watching our videos. Uh, it's just, it's been really great. And, you know, like Eric said, you know, I just feel like we've reached a whole new audience, a whole new community and, and I hope we keep those channels open. Um, we are scheduled to move to a coffee wine hour. Um, I'm not sure how this works virtually, but I know that Laura Moriali and her team are gonna have some things to say. Um, we should give you some time to have, to go get your coffee or your wine or your sandwich or whatever it is that you want to eat. Um, so maybe we'll just sort of stay on, but in like five minutes, we'll kind of regroup and, or, or 10 minutes or whenever and uh, have Laura, is Laura here? Here I am. And I think five to 10 minutes is fantastic. We're, we're all sort of collecting here, so that'll be great. Okay, so feel free to take a break. We'll be back in 10 minutes. I'm, I'm gonna stay on line here, so. And anyone else can stay on if you want. <laughs> 